Right. Um, good evening to all of you. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you for the monthly experts webinar series conducted by the Ceylon College of Physicians in collaboration with its uh, sister colleges. And uh, this time it's us as the Ceylon College of Critical Care Specialists coordinate in this event. And today we have two speakers from UK, both are Sri Lankans, proud to say, accepted our invitation to talk to us on a very timely topics in critical care medicine. And especially during this COVID pandemic, uh, all of us are experiencing very difficult times and searching for way out to battle, our, battle out against a virus, which is mutating fast and humans are as host who are struggling to produce a good uh, response. Now each speaker will have 40 minutes each and I would like to take questions at, after each session. So I would like to ask the viewers uh, to um, send their questions uh, during the speech. Uh, for, as the first speaker, we have uh, Dr. Razi Maharuf. Uh, he's no stranger to us. He's a consultant uh, in critical care medicine and clinical governance, late attached to Adam Brooks Hospital of Cambridge University's Trust. Uh, and uh, he's also a visiting professor and international examiner in critical care medicine. Uh, he's also the regional lead for flu pandemic research. Um, uh, Dr. Maharuf is going to talk to us on double-edged sword in uh, critical care, which is steroids. Uh, over to you, Dr. Maharuf. Can you hear me? Hope you can. All right. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction there, Dilshan. I'm just going to share my screen with you all and hopefully get this show on the road. Uh, my topic today, uh, as you heard, is about the double-edged sword in critical care. And I'm going to address the issue of the use of um, steroids, especially corticosteroids in the management of the uh, critical ill patients, uh, especially in ICU setting. And this is quite a broad topic. Uh, I've been trying to keep focus as much as possible and relevant, especially with um, sadly what uh, everyone there is currently going through. So just a little bit of context as everyone settles in, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about Addison's disease. It comes from Thomas Addison in 1855, who essentially described this TB destruction of an adrenal gland that led to hypoadrenalism. And then uh, subsequently, Philip Hensch used some thing called compound E, uh, essentially steroid containing compound to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And then we've never looked back since, uh, been using steroids or steroid related compounds in several different types of uh, single organ or multi-system disease. As we know, physiologically, I know steroids are very potent hormones. They have a diverse level of physiological effects, uh, affects multiple different organs in a beneficial and sometimes in a deleterious manner. So use cautious, judicious use of steroids is very, very important. And there is always the potential for adverse consequences and the manner of balancing out risk versus benefit is every doctor's nightmare for the patients that they're in front of. However, there is also potentially a significant impact that you can have by judicious, careful, uh, in a hopefully evidence-based use of steroids in certain conditions and we'll discuss them in turn. Uh, we know that Particularly, we're going to talk about the glucocorticoid uses uh, have the effects of anti-inflammatory action and immunosuppression and so on. They also have the metabolic effects that are not necessarily wanted, but you, it comes with it. And but also there are other mineral corticoid effects of uh, steroids uh, have the water and electrolyte balance issues that could be uh, potentially useful, but needs to be used with caution. So having said that, diving into the talk, um, we have a huge lo long list of indications that we could use. But what I'm not going to address is other conditions where steroid use is indicated for the underlying conditions per se. That's pretty straightforward. And we have a lot of expertise probably in the room and beyond of its use outside of ICU. We're not going to discuss that. What we would like to discuss is the issues perhaps might require us to decide on whether A, to use a steroid of some sort within a critical care unit. And if you're going to do that, what for and for how long? 
And in that area, I want to address three particular aspects that has been somewhat controversial and has been a matter of debate and continues to be a matter of debate uh, in shock in the use of steroids for a refractory shock, especially septic shock, the use of steroids in non-COVID acute respiratory distress syndrome, and also in particularly topically, the use of steroids in COVID-related acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. So without further ado, um, the questions that we have in my mind, especially when I think of, you know, whether someone uh, in, you know, who's on my unit may need some steroids for the management of their critical illness. I have four particular questions that go through my mind. Is this person, do they need the steroids? Is it indicated? So therefore, who should get the steroids and what does the evidence say about that? And if I'm going to give them a steroid, and usually it's hydrocortisone, but we can have so many different equivalent you know, dosage, other steroids. But if I'm going to use that, if so, how much of it am I going to use? And if I give it to them, how long, am I, how long am I going to give it to them for? What's the optimum time? And does the evidence help us answer any of these things? And collectively, does this evidence help us to know if it makes any difference at all? So uh, to answer that question, I think we need a little bit of context about who should get the steroids and how we may be able to assess that. One of the problems is that the critical illness in induces by way of the stresses on the body, either an absolute, which is relatively, relatively rare, it's about 3% or so of the uh, reported incidence of critically ill patients who have absolute adrenal insufficiency. But relative adrenal insufficiency is much more common. And that's probably what we come across on a day-to-day -day basis. In these patients who have lost their diurnal, diurnal variation, which is common to us all in our sleep cycle and our steroid levels, therefore measuring it and also the impact of a loss of diurnal variation is difficult to gauge on normal physiology. So therefore, if I or you were to take a free cortisol level, level as such and assess its uh, impact, it's difficult to do because the impact on each person on a day-to-day -day basis varies. The underlying disease process has caused their hypoadrenalism, and especially if it's relative adrenal insufficiency, it's very difficult to be precise and reproducible through the course of their illness. So the, the powers that be that have looked into this in a lot of detail have come across this or, or, or produced this term called critical illness-related corticosteroid insufficiency, or CIRCI, as you were uh, on here. And the difficulty with all of these things is that because the way that cortisol behaves and also the way that it is um, measured in the lab, because the lab assays, the plasma cortisol and ACTH simulation tests are unreliable at the best of times because of the way they're measured. And that's because of the fact that A, there is no robust uh, uh, relationship between serum levels and cortisol and mortality, and it makes it difficult to say at which point should we intervene and what level should we think about giving someone a steroid supplementation to help with their recovery of their critical illness. But more importantly, with regards to free cortisol levels, most labs measure a total free and bound cortisol. And therefore, what proportion of that uh, level that you see as a result is difficult to see as to what is active. But even if you've got a free cortisol level, it's not necessarily conclusive because free cortisol levels don't correlate well with tissue concentration. Therefore, end organ function from that uh, cortisol level is difficult to gauge in a reliable manner. It's not linear function. So how about if you were to stimulate someone we suspect to have, have uh, relative hypoadrenalism, and whether we use a high dose or a low dose doesn't seem to make much in the way of uh, uh, helping us to see who's going to benefit with regards to the non-responders. There is some emerging evidence having said that, that the lower dose or one microgram ACTH stimulation, the tiny dose, might actually be better identifying the non-responders because it doesn't stimulate them too much. And we may be able to you know, find out a bit more about this over the next coming years. So given this context, all of the societies of critical care medicine have decided 
that people who you are going to, to give supplemental glucocorticoid support or steroids in crit their critical illness, especially for shock, should be a matter of clinical judgment. And that would depend on whether you feel and you assess them to be volume repleted, they be you know, resuscitated, and the presser that you're going to use, if there's no epinephrine, phenylephrine, metaraminol, or whatever else of this of choice, is now they are becoming refractory to it. And we would, on our unit, start thinking about supplementing uh, um, uh, shock steroids for people who are getting above a 0.15 mics per kilo per minute of norepinephrine and definitely above 0.2 mics per kilo per minute as something that we wouldn't have much you know, hesitancy in uh, uh, prescribing for them. So that's about who should get steroids. But if you're going to give that, how much of it, what are we going to give? So what does the evidence say? So I've broken the main uh, studies that we've had in the last 20 years or so into two different parts. The, they're all big trials uh, and the ones that showed a mortality benefit. And after all, we're only treating, or not only, but one of our primary reasons of treating our patients in critical care units is to try to help them survive their illness. And mortality is a pretty much a very important aspect of my uh, a, you know, aspirations of treating my patients. And I'm sure everyone would agree with that. So the mortality benefit trials are actually in the minority with regards to steroid supplementation in shock uh, steroid uh, support in critical care. So these two uh, trials about were both actually run by Gilali Annan, who is a French intensivist who produced this data. We both had on a daily basis, a very similar dose of hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. And, a, and they showed some level of mortality benefit. 300 and 1,200 patients there. The ones that did not show not mortality benefit was spread over about 10 years or so. And they were relatively large trials using very similar doses of hydrocortisone, but only one used the fludrocortisone. We'll come to discuss fludrocortisone in a minute. So therefore, across these several studies with large numbers of patients, randomized control studies in first world countries, as it were, we can't decide as to how much of which steroid to use. There's no clear evidence for it. How about for how long? <clears throat> so again, keeping that same format of mortality benefit and no mortality benefit, they all seem to vary around seven days of uh, support in their trials for the treatment arm. And the ones that uh, went beyond that, the high press and the vanish trials, both in 2016, took it across um, about 11 days or so, but for the tapered for the last few uh, days of that trial. <clears throat> so we don't necessarily know from this data as to um, how long we should give for, because very similar times between the two groups did not show any difference with regards to their uh, mortality benefit. Does it make any difference at all uh, to the patients? Um, to the, the, the trial design was adequate. They were, they were uh, large trials. They were randomized control. They were blinded. They had good numbers. They had very similar doses. They had a very similar duration of um, treatment. And there even was a meta-analysis of that um, that was produced. But uh, the main finding from all of these studies were that they had a quicker resolution of shock they, they uh, as a consequence of that, perhaps their duration of mechanical ventilation was possibly shorter, but, uh, and, and as a consequence, perhaps their length of stay in ICU, but it did not convert to benefit with regards to mortality, which is pretty crucial. There were some studies, especially the Gilali Annan ones, which used food recordosone, that seemed to produce a benefit with regards to mortality. And perhaps people have started to start to think, perhaps food recordosone has an impact that hydrocortisone per se does not. There's a significant level of mineral corticoid activity that hydrocortisone has, but food recordosone is a very strong mineral corticoid. So some people would still use food recordosone on top of the hydrocortisone. But the study called COITS, where they looked at the use of insulin control, as well as uh, steroids in, in, sept in septic shock, especially where the food recortisone was added to their uh, treatment arm, did not show a benefit in mortality. So it raises a very important question. 
because of the fact that there are significant you know, side effects of these. And one of these things is something we know does harm to patients' uh, chance of survival in critical illness, especially hyperglycemia. Uh, Greek Vandenberg, you know, would be really upset if we weren't controlling these, you know, glucose levels very strictly. And she has produced very, very good data, so has nice sugar and beyond, about how important it is for insulin use in critical illness to ensure glucose control to, and now we're aiming for somewhere between six and 10. The question was, you know, does the benefit that you get from use of shock steroids in, uh, in, in septic shock get counterbalanced by the disadvantages of uncontrolled hyperglycemia? And that's a difficult question to answer because the COIT st study previously that I mentioned did use insulin for control of uh, sugars whilst they were on the steroids and used the fluid recortisone, uh, but did not show any particular benefit. I mean, is the hypernatremia aspect of a continued use of steroids and also muscle bulk loss, you know, protein catabolism, uremia, delirium, which all impacts on survival and, you know, uh, return to normality from critical illness. There's also the fluid retention aspect because the fact that we do know it's one of the mantras of ventilating someone safely now is to ensure that their lungs don't get wet. So trying to run them dry so that their oxygen exchange and ventilator capacity is optimized it goes counter to the fluid retention that you might have with uses or use of you know, steroids in uh, septic shock. There's also the question about secondary infection. And all through these studies, they reported a higher level of secondary infections, but statistically, it was not significant. And, um, and it did not convert to any uh, outcome loss. And that's another question. You know, though it is not statistically significant, is the survival benefit that you're getting from the use of steroids in shock being countered, excuse me, by the increased risk of a ventilator-associated pneumonia, hospital-associated pneumonia, a UTI, some form of hospital-associated infection? And that question still remains to be answered. Now, that's a problem because of the fact that, you know, when we know that you, when we use steroids and any practicing, you know, intensive would say that they have seen the benefits of using or adding a something like hydrocortisone to a refractory septic shock quite frequently. It reduces the, the requirement for norepinephrine or equivalent vasopressor. If you're on norepinephrine and vasopressin and or methylene blue, for severe uh, septic shock, as I was doing this morning, right, in someone who's got very severe gram-negative sepsis, and addition of a, a hydrocortisone has shown tremendous benefit even this morning. His methylene blues off, argipressin, which is vasopressin, you know, a surrogate is nearly off, and he's just on some norepinephrine. We see tangibly that the steroids actually help. But it's a bit of a problem because of the fact that physiologically, as far as we can understand, they have gone back to normal physiological function. Their hearts are pumping. Their blood is carrying oxygen around to the cells. By way of that, doing that, you're, you're encouraging aerobic respiration. So in your mind and my mind, I think we think that that should, therefore, the trade-off should be, it should equate to improvement, improvement in survival, rest deaths. But however, there are, all the data that we've seen in it tangibly so far suggests that just normalization of physiological parameters does not necessarily translate to improvement in outcome. And that's a big stumbling block in critical care, partly probably because we have a hugely heterogeneous set of population who have a heterogeneous level set of diseases that get bundled into these trials that get looked at. There's also the genomics of different patients who have variable function and responses to a, an insult, in this case, in septic shock, maybe, of a certain infection, how a group A might uh, respond to a particular disease different to patient B or patient C or their mother and the grandfather may be very similar with regards to their family genotype, but their phenotype will be very different. So there are a lot of things about this that we still probably do not understand. But the inverse is definitely true. 
if we don't uh, um, restore normal physiological parameters, death will soon follow. We know that. But unfortunately, uh, you know, doing our very best within the normal accepted uh, 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 best practice of critical care to restore physiological uh, function of our bodies does not necessarily guarantee improvement in outcome, especially survival. And that's a big question that I think for the next generation, or perhaps even before that, you know, we we'll get make some inroads into trying to understand. And maybe the part of doing that is incisive personalized medicine, like what the oncologists are getting up to these days. We'll discuss that more in a, in, in a moment. So that's essentially about the use of steroids in shock. To uh, transition on to the use of steroids in uh, ARDS, and this is, you know, as a whole, you know, we have this uh, syndrome of acute respiratory dis distress syndrome. It's, it's a massive, uh, uh, you know, bucket where we can put lots of stuff into, right? We can have viral pneumonitis, bacterial pneumonia, pancreatitis, peritonitis, acid aspiration, you name it, right? There's so many things that will have a final common pathway that will fit into the clinical, radiological, and perhaps even cytological definitions of ARDS. You're dealing with a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema state, but it's bilateral. Lung injury is common. Severe lung injury is common. So in this final common pathway of multiple disease processes, the insult seems to be very similar when it comes to the cellular parenchymal uh, lung architectural level. But perhaps even though the final common cellular pathway, the inflammatory pathway may be similar, managing these separate diseases is actually different. We know it's disparate because before they get very ill, we manage them very, very differently to a pneumonia, to a pancreatitis, to an acid aspiration, to whatever else. So perhaps understanding about the trigger and onto the final common pathway of ARDS and lung injury is the transition point at which a lot of these newer interventions perhaps will come our way can make some inroads into. However, with our current understanding, we have improved outcomes for patients who have very severe ARDS, and particularly because of a seminal paper from the ArtsNet network from 2000 that has borne out a worldwide use of lung protective ventilation. And in many ways, it's the only bit of evidence that actually test, you know, stood the test of time. A lot of things that are proven in critical care, critical care have been disproven and proven again and, pro and disproven again. And that's probably partly because of study design and everything else. But lung protective ventilation has stood the test of time, partly probably because we are designed to be beings or a thoracic ventilatory system that runs on negative pressure ventilation. When it's subjected to any positive pressure ventilation, it does not like it, especially with regards to a positive pressure injurious ventilation. It promotes an inflammatory response, a cytokine response, a neutrophil activation and injury. Therefore, lung protective ventilation in many ways is not unexpected as, as to be a very useful intervention in ensuring that you improve outcome. And it's an easy thing to do as long as you pay attention. And the open lung ventilation to try to ventilate in a high PEEP uh, strategy and ensuring relaxation dry lungs, prone positioning have all come out to be good practice. They have shown mortality benefits. There's potential that inhaled prostaglandin I2 or epiprostinol could also improve uh, uh, ventilated parameters, but not necessarily shown to be converted to mortality benefit. And we'll see further trials as they come. So that in, uh, uh, in essence is what we're dealing with as a whole in ARDS and uh, people have postulated that given there is a very inflammatory process, perhaps an uncontrolled hyperinflammatory attack to lung parenchymal uh, 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 architecture leads to a, a final common pathway, as you mentioned, that is disparate, that is removed from whatever the initial insult was. And once you set that on, there is something else that's driving the whole process through. And one of the easy ways to try to reverse that hyperinflammation or inflammatory attack was perhaps to try to modulate the level of inflammation at a parenchymal or cellular level uh, at the lung surface. 
And trying to understand this, they've tried to, to, to break the process of ARDS into stages. And in this case, uh, you know, the most common one is you talk about three different phases, where it's an exudative phase, they get wet, getting wet because not because of your left ventricle and diastolic pressure is going up. You've not got back pressure from the left atrium, it's non-cardiogenic, and essentially because your endothelial leak is taking place in the maraparenchymal level, which promotes a inflammatory reaction, which is proliferative from then onwards. And proliferation quite frequently we know ends up in a healing phase that is quite frequently fibrotic and causes a irreversible change in the lung architecture, actually, definitely in the short to medium term. So could the use of steroids in these patients be useful to try to A, avoid this from taking place and or reverse a proliferative or fibrotic phase. And in doing so, because the, the concern, particularly of not dampening down an appropriate immune response, especially in the setting of ARDS, in the setting of infection, uh, and uh, even in people who are well uh, you know, immunocompetent, but also in immunosuppressed or transplant patients, people have used steroids, particularly in the latter stage of the ARDS, to see if that will improve their outcome in ARDS. That has not, unfortunately, stood the test of time. And we know this from previous data that was produced all the way in this slide, for example, several different uh, uh, you know, bodies of work uh, going from 1985 through to 1988 in regards to trying to prevention of ARDS on the left side of this slide, or the trials that looked at the treatment with steroids for ARDS to see if there's an improvement in outcome. Unfortunately, nothing has been conclusive. The problem about saying that something that perhaps intuitively makes sense doesn't produce evidence to an academic is that they don't give up. <laughs> so they carried on. And with the test of time over the last 15 years or so, they've been slowly producing a little bit of um, evidence as a trickle, as either meta-analyses or smaller trials, or a direct comparison of the use of steroids, especially at an early phase of ARDS, to see if that transition to a proliferative and or fibrotic phase of ARDS could be dampened to the point that there may be some improvement in mortality. And this uh, couple of overlaid slides is essentially to convey to you is that there is now emerging evidence that use of steroids, especially in early stage, could reduce uh, uh, death in patients with moderate to severe ARDS. It might reduce your time in your ventilator, a mechanical ventilator, for a collection of different reasons why people might end up with ARDS. Uh, and also, uh, ensuring that they are all done with good attention to all the other things that make your survival from ARDS better. And we'll come to that point in a second. So this culminated in this study called DEXA-ARDS, the dexamethasone treatment for the acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's a Spanish trial. There were 17 ICUs in Spain uh, that produced this body of work. And I'm just going to draw your attention to uh, the date on this uh, publication in The Lancet. And it's just before COVID hit us in the UK, uh, in Feb early February 2020, where, you know, we're going through this uncertain period uh, in the world. Obviously, we saw what was happening in uh, Hubei and Wuhan. Uh, and obviously, Italy was starting to happen around this time, quite badly in Lombardy. Uh, and uh, and obviously excitement was to come our way, excitement or disaster, whichever you want to call it. But this data was coming through from uh, pre-COVID about the use of dexamethasone in ARDS. Just to touch on this uh, study for a little uh, moment, uh, they used dexamethasone at 20 milligrams a day, which is quite potent, right, for, for day one to day five. And they tapered it down to 10 milligrams uh, for the day six to 10, or to the point of extubation. If they extubated before that time, they will uh, you know, discontinue the use of dexamethasone. They showed that the um, me mechanical ventilator period was significantly shortened, about 14 to 19 days, and the mortality was significantly less. There was a better you know, uh, oxygenation ratio, which is what we call a PF, the PaO2 to the FiO2 ratio 
uh, in this uh, uh, group of patients. But they did have a high extubation failure rate, which is not quite fully explained as to you know, why that happened. It's also important to note that when you have an intervention in a uh, emerging set of evidence or, an, uh, or practice, it's important that we don't ditch the standard practice that we know works. And I mean, we know that works, especially since COVID came through, prone position ventilation has saved many lives in, in, you know, during this period. And there was no a, a protocolized way of managing this ventilation in this study. And that's a significant downside for me in the treatment arm is proneness. One argument is that even though it didn't get prone, that you know, they still did well with regards to their steroids. The other point is if you didn't did prone them, they might not have needed the steroids and you would have overcome the, uh, the problem. But as to whether being in that prone position would have reduced their duration of ventilation or changed their, um, uh, uh, their mortality is unanswered by this trial because they have gone away from standard practice, especially as a group. And that's a bit odd. Um, steroids in the early phase is the question whether you know um, because the fact that this was institute, instituted soon after the mechanical ventilation was commenced in this group and whether you know a using that didn't necessarily increase their risk of infection there's a standard period of time where perhaps it prevented them going into a proliferative or fibrotic phase so this has and with COVID as well has sparked a lot of interest in the UK this is our colleague uh, Manu Shankarhari from King's College, who's written to all of us uh, a couple of weeks ago to say, uh, you know, do you think we should have a trial of corticosteroids in non-COVID ARDS? I think the short answer is yes, um, but the thing ha it has to be, you know, properly designed, uh, and you know, it'll be a real tragedy if we went through all of this and didn't come out of it on the other side uh, with a robust trial, which gets picked on with lots of holes. So hopefully we'll put together something that's gonna be of a meaningful benefit. Uh, so watch this space. So moving on to uh, COVID ARDS, um, before for all of the young people in the room, right? Before you know, COVID-2, the sequel happened, as it were, SARS-CoV-2, we were dealing with SARS-CoV-2 itself one in 2004, yeah, especially around Hong Kong, where the coronavirus uh, SARS, you know, was causing everyone to get a little bit twitchy because of what was isolated at the time. And at that time, there was a debate as to whether steroids will be beneficial. And this is a quote from Charles Gomesel himself from Hong Kong. It says that the early phase of the disease appears to be due to the virus, whereas the later phase is thought to be an inflammatory response. And he was forecasting uh, and uh, the foresight to what exactly, in my view, is happening with COVID now. Virus itself is a switch. What causes severe inflammatory changes and severe illness after that appears to be an uncontrolled and unbalanced hyperimmune response. And no um, wonder in that situation that lots of the antivirals and direct antiviral function interventions are not shown to be beneficial, like hydro hydroxychloroquine, azith azithromycin, ribavirin, and, and so on. Uh, by the time it gets severe disease, the virus is switched to switch on and moved on. It's just hanging around. The body is doing its own destruction in itself. So the it, I'll be, you know, pretty honest. I was, you know, surprised that dexamethasone was included in the recovery trial because of the previous data we had from SARS in 2004 and also MERS uh, in, you know, in the Middle East and respiratory syncytial virus or syndrome. Forgive me, not respiratory syncytial. Uh, Middle East and respiratory syndrome, uh, the equivalent coronavirus from camels, and they didn't show any benefit. But the numbers. Uh, uh, were much smaller. They didn't have the benefit of the recovery or the remap cap that you probably hear up uh, soon. Uh, and so therefore it's difficult to say what benefit or loss they had. So recovery and remap cap produced this landmark paper that came out as a preprint last June. 
Dexamethasone in hospitalized patients in COVID-19, 6,425 patients, an absolute phenomenal effort. One to two randomization, about 2,000 patients in, in the treatment arm, unblinded though, unfortunately, but across 176 UK NHS hospitals. Given six milligrams a day of uh, dexamethasone for 28 days, and it's shown that, especially if you're mechanically ventilated, it had a profound impact in your survival. Number needed to treat us eight. Stuff that you haven't seen in a long time. Right? If you were just on some oxygen therapy, number needed to treat us 25. Phenomenal. But if you didn't have you know, respiratory failure, if you were given dexamethasone, was counterproductive has increased your mortality, risk of mortality. The nuance may be that particularly, especially from a study design perspective, all of the people who have benefited, especially from dexamethasone, appear to have given it after seven days of onset of symptoms. Doesn't seem to have translated into practice these days. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through this. It's a busy slides, a lot of numbers is unnecessary anyway. So um, the pitfalls slightly is that whenever I see such, you know, incredible amount of benefit from a single inter intervention, my pessimistic side uh, starts to wake up, unfortunately. Partly because, you know, I've lost my hair reading through all of these and it's great over time and I've seen how this all turns out in time. But also the fact that there are so many other things that perhaps were not necessarily taken into consideration. The numbers that are coming through the critical care with COVID are absolutely phenomenal. And if you ran a normal service, including a normal NHS and ran them at a normal ICU capacity, our mortality would have been through the roof. I think our local mortality compared better with the national mortality, partly and probably to a huge uh, extent, a third less in, in many ways, because of the fact that we were able to nearly double our ICU capacity. And most of our ICU patients, our length of stay was very, very long. And when we did our regression analysis, we, you know, for, to reduce the risk of death from, from a severe ARDS to a normal ARDS uh, risk for COVID to non-COVID was 28 days of ventilation. You need to have capacity to do that. You need to have adequate amount of staff. You need to have oxygen machines, people on the shop floor all the time. And that you know, as to how much of that was capable for the, all the trusts around the country to deliver in a very similar manner is questionable. But then 6,000 patients perhaps iron those things out because the statistical correction is there between those who have and are not able to provide this level of support. But the emerging question amongst the patients, especially with severe COVID, is that, is there subtypes of COVID? We know that people you know, uh, uh, respond or, or react to infection with COVID in different manners, and they have a very different clinical course. Is that going to be correlated to the way that, you know, their chances of uh, outcome, A? But should we also cater the way that we look after them, depending on how they, uh, uh, which subtype it is? And, you know, with time, perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll understand this a bit better. Um, um, this, this essentially is to say that if we didn't have the capacity, right, this red line in the bottom one is, is where our standard, you know, uh, critical care uh, um, capacity was, and everyone who was above that would have essentially, you know, the ones who came to ICU with severe disease would have died. And without the capacity, it's very difficult to, to unpick. And this is a slide of how we had to prone people, and we had to do that 20, 30 times a day. But to look at also the, the impact of very you know, um, eye-catching amount of data that comes out, I mean, I'm reminded of a study that came out back in 2001, which is the river study, the early goal directed therapy, which essentially was pivotal in changing the way that we manage sepsis and also the surviving sepsis campaign. And about use of you know, early goal directed therapy to try to improve people's outcome. But we've never been able to reproduce that. There are three studies that are you know, summarized below, which have much larger numbers, the promise, the process, and the arise, 12, 60, 13, 50, and 1,600 patients in three different continents who could not reproduce the level of evidence. That they so I'm taking a little bit of skepticism that perhaps is a subgroup of patients within COVID that will benefit from definitely use of steroids. But there is the risk of secondary infection in these patients that we know that is very common, especially when they're ventilated 
uh, and uh, develop a VAP after you know some time on the ventilator. Gram-negative sepsis is something we've seen quite a lot of uh, on uh, at in Cambridge, and we're starting to see a lot more of aspergillus in COVID-related ventilation. We've heard about the black fungus in in India. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, but partly because anecdotally, if you get severe COVID, you essentially get the kitchen sink thrown at you. You get hydrocortisone, sorry, dexamethasone, you get hydroxychloroquine, you get azithromycin, you get ribavirin, you get ivermectin. And whatever that can be pulled out of the shelf is you know, shoved down your throat and off you go. But as to whether that, that level of you know, uh, support is appropriate or not, we'll understand in the future. But there definitely seems to be some degree of complement activation, especially C5A immunoparesis. And that level of immunoparesis and complement activation perhaps is driving some degree of you know, secondary infection and trying to uh, modulate that with the use of steroids and try to prevent hyperimmune response is going to be a very difficult uh, a, a balance to strike. Steroids, at least from, you know, we'll hear a lot more about immunomodulation from Dr. Wanderpur in a second, but at least the, the, the time of duration of action is going to be very short. So at least, you know, you might, even if you get it wrong for a certain extent, you might be able to bridge that through and get them off. Um, but I feel that most of the benefit that we see in ICU is because of hard graft. Because we do, if we do the simple things well, and we stop, you know, do the things diligently in a committed manner, we are precise, pay attention to detail, we have consent, consistent and committed care. That adds a huge deal with regards to the benefit that patients get. And we are looking for a silver bullet, and perhaps dexamethasone, will be the silver bullet that we've already found. It's a cheap alternative and it's very accessible to the world. But um, we will continue to monitor the benefits of it. And especially with the uh, emerging second and third wave, the patients who are coming through the critical care are the ones who fail on dexamethasone on the ward, et cetera. It's going to be very interesting to see whether we can hone in on who definitely benefits from this or any other, other immunomodulators or any newer treatments that we're gonna hear about whether it's going to be driven by specific personalized genotype, phenotype uh, driven management that will perhaps come into our practice in the future. That's all from me. Thanks very much for listening as I'm at bang on 40 minutes. Right? And I'll take any questions. <clears throat> uh Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maru, for that interesting lecture. Uh, uh, I think we have uh, one question. Uh, now, uh, now, steroids, I think we've been using for so many diseases as, and also for COVID. Now, uh, now after this trial, the people used to uh, trial on six milligrams of uh, dexamethasone, but as you uh, told that, uh, so many, you know, drugs or treatment therapies have been trialed. And some believe that uh, the six milligrams of dexamethasone is not enough because, uh, because the, the, the patients are behaving differently and they are, they are, as you said, the genotype or the phenotype is different. Uh, have you tried uh, any different regimes of steroids? I know that some centers, even in UK, they uh, try different uh, regimes. So do you see any benefit of this or are you going on the same dose or what's your opinion on, on different regimes of steroids, including methylprednisolone? Yes, so we are sticking to, uh, we are sticking to the trial uh, data of 6.6 .6 milligrams. That's what was used across the, the body of participants regardless of their weight, their height, their age, you know, how sick they were, et cetera. And it is how it was randomized and is the only way that we have robust evidence for. Also, the fact that uh, the duration was 10 days and, and that's what we're sticking with because it, the numbers of participants that were used, you know, in the trial uh, participated was very, very good. So all of the, for all of the sort of questionable things that I was questioning about, and the, on the other hand, it was a, a very well designed, uh, very large, quickly put together, 
well-executed trial. So we can't take that away from them. And across the group of people, it seemed to help. Whether you're going to see asking about whether the subgroup should be adjusted for the recovery trial, correct me if I'm wrong, Chamra, is that it didn't necessarily you know, account for that. We did use a, a non-dexamethasone, uh, you know, uh, regimens uh, for you know pregnant women, for example, you know, not to induce a level of lung maturation in 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 um, babies in their fetuses. So, um, so we did use either prednisolone of forty milligrams, if I remember correctly, or methylprednisolone equivalent. But you know, six milligrams a day of uh, dexamethasone is not to be sniffed now. It is a three to four hundred milligrams of you know, equivalent of hydro quarter, if I'm not mistaken, that, you know, the, it is a, a potent uh, glucocorticoid. It's a potent anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drug. And, and it, is, it is important when you're dosing these people not to dose them necessarily on body weight. It's important that we take into consideration their, 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 their body compartments, especially the ideal body weight in using the doses. So therefore, just because someone's bigger, uh, and it's not necessarily a very, you know, lipid soluble drug, as it were. So therefore, we don't necessarily use a kind of continuous inf infusion. So to correct for that, uh, we are not doing. Uh, we have no intention of doing. The other question. I is also add to that, Gilshan, if I may. I think trial drugs should not be used in compassionate grounds because that gives us that 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 effectively muddies the water. And as Dr. Maro said, that the recovery has. Has quickly put a, a, a trial, but it has given us some valid, robust evidence. So you should be sticking it to what the trial has said. Having said that, there is another trial registered. There are numerous trials registered um, under COVID. There is a one trial registered uh, for extended use of steroids. And who knows in future, in, in years to come, in the new normality, we might have a different regime, but as we speak, six milligrams per 10 days, and that's, that's equivalent to 40 milligrams of prednisolone per a day, which is a quite a hectic dose, uh, uh, is what, what's the standard of care. The other question that uh, uh, I want to ask now, you said there, are, there were certain patients who came to the ICU who were on steroids, but you, they, you know, they were not improving, so they needed ICU admission. In those sort of patients, did you uh, sort of implement a different strategy or you just, you know, if they needed intubation and ventilation, you go ahead and then watch and wait uh, till their, you know, the lungs improve on their own? So essentially, th this were, was coming into the second wave, as it were, majority of them. So people who were failing on their initial dexamethasone therapy on the ward. And quite a few of them were given remdesivir as well. And it's about around the time that tocilizumab was, uh, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that from Dr. Wanderper in a second, um, was uh, being authorized for, for use. So that was one option that was available for us uh, for appropriate you know, indicated use. Uh, we did not hold back on uh, converting someone to mechanical ventilation. I know that Recovery RS has just produced a, uh, a <coughs> preprint currently that looked at you know, CPAP versus uh, mm -hmm. nasal high flow versus standard support. And that you know, a lot of uh, um, uh, networks, especially media networks have you know, picked that up and are saying that you know, if you want to stay alive from severe COVID, don't get mechanically ventilated. And that to me, is a wrong message to send out from that trial, partly because the fact that they reported that, you know, that CPAP, you know, improves your survival, but it doesn't necessarily suggest that, that they improved their survival, partly because they didn't need to be mechanically ventilated. They weren't sick enough to be mechanically ventilated, number one. And the, the people who went into, you know, uh, who failed CPAP or nasal high flow or whatever else, and went on to be mechanical ventilated or died are reported as one bunch. You know, we were having this discussion the other day. Is that you know, when you get into a, an aeroplane, you know, I'm trying to get to a destination, and the destination is a bit COVID is survival for anyone who is in that situation. They're offering either a first class or an economy seat next to the toilets, and someone might get moved around. But at the end of the day, I don't care which seat I'm in, as long as I get to my destination. That paper does not show you whether they get to that destination, but it's been picked up by the, uh, uh, the media and run across 
across the networks as being that if you want to remain alive from COVID, you shouldn't get ventilated. Some people, you know, who remains, uh, remain on CPAP or NIV and survive, that's fantastic. Partly probably because of the fact that, you know, they didn't necessarily need to be mechanically ventilated. But those who failed and needed mechanical ventilation needed mechanical ventilation for longer. And that transition point where you decide when to transition someone from CPAP to mechanical ventilation is absolutely pivotal. And if you get that wrong, then you're going to increase their chance of uh, 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 death on that. And we don't have enough evidence to say that. And we're getting people coming through who are, who've got severe COVID, who don't want to go on a mechanical ventilator because of this message that's coming through. And that's going to be counterproductive. So coming back uh, to your you know, uh, original question about you know, how we, we manage these guys is that, you know, they'll be on the steroids, they'll be on the remdesivir if it's indicated. We'll give them some tocilizumab, but we'll ventilate them. We'll ventilate them when they need to be ventilated. We'll keep them on the, the NIV or CPAP as, as they required, but we would not shy away from mechanical ventilation, prone position ventilation, tracheostomy ECMOs as indicated, right? So the, if the patient required from a medical point and indicated to have mechanical ventilation, we would do that. We have another question. Do you see a difference in the steroid response in patients having H type and uh, L type lungs? That's a very good question. And, you know, one of my colleagues says that, you know, three, three days of COVID is like one day of normal ARDS, right? So, so that probably is a very slow process of development ARDS is defers and probably because it's the viral pneumonitis when they present, as long as they don't have a secondary bacterial infection. And therefore they have very compliant lungs, but a huge level of VQ mismatch, as you know, right? But if you give it time, it gets worse. So the, uh, the, the steroid you know, improvement perhaps, if you see, is to prevent someone who's got compliant lungs to not develop stiff lungs in, later on. And that is something that we've not seen, unfortunately. So the people who have failed the dexamethasone on the ward essentially uh, suggest that they are non-responders to this you know, anti-inflammatory support they're getting. And quite frequently, if they fail and their lungs get stiff after that, and they're on the mechanical ventilator, we see the transition of their, their lungs into a, a stiffer set. And I suspect you know, in, a, in the traditional variety of ARDS, when they're on the ward before they see you, Idilshan, in, 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 uh, on ICU, they probably have the H-type lungs out there. We just haven't seen them uh, as such because they're not coming to us in a profound hypoxemic respiratory failure state. And particularly because of isolation and, and, and what ICUs were doing, you're we seeing these people with severe you know, COVID early in ICU, we're seeing these very compliant lungs. If you look at Gattinoni's data from 15 years ago from his paper, you know, they are DS patients that he was producing had very similar compliant lungs, like the, the compliant lungs of early, early COVID that we have now. This is not different. It's just because of the fact that we're seeing a lot of it early on on ICU. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Maharuf. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, time. And uh, I would like to move on to the, the next speaker. And um, so let me introduce, uh, he's Dr. Chamar Varnapura. He's again, no stranger to us to all the Sri Lankans. And um, he's a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care medicine, and he uh, led critical care follow-up service, Luton and Dunstable uh, University Hospital in UK. And he's a faculty tutor for intensive care medicine uh, in FICM. Uh, he is involved in many research activities and interesting, he's one of the principal investigators of remap cap trial in uh, the relevant hospital, and also a co-investigator for recovery trial and the, uh, the uh, Luton and Dunstable uh, University Hospital. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chamar Varapura is going to talk to us on a future weapon, uh, which is immunomodulation in critical care. Go to uh, Dr. Varapura. Well, thank you. Thank you for those kind words of introduction and um, thank you for the um, invitation. I will share my screen first. So I'm going to talk about uh, immunomodulation in critical care, particularly in the context of uh, current COVID pandemic. 
And uh, as mentioned earlier, I am the principal investigator, local principal investigator for Remap Cup and co-investigator for Recovery Drive. We're very uh, proud to say that uh, uh, and Dumpstable Trust is uh, one of the uh, topmost trusts when it comes to uh, recruiting patients for recovery trial within the first three trusts in UK uh, um, when it comes to recruiting patients for recovery trial. So before I talk about the immune modulation, I thought I would quickly run through um, about the pathophysiology of COVID. As you know, uh, the virus enters via the um, airway and it's an RNA virus and it bounds to the um, angiotensin conversing and converting enzyme to on the respiratory epithelial cells and then uh, use the uh, host uh, mechanism to multiplicate and release of many million copies of um, uh, COVID virions. And this process attracts uh, various um, inflammatory cells um, like macrophages, like neutrophils, like monocytes, like lymphocytes, and various other uh, inflammatory mediators um, who act together with activation of the coagulation system and formation of a microtome by right? the end result is that uh, increased permeability of the um, alveolar capillary uh, endothelium resulting in um, thickening of the uh, alveolar capillary membrane, formation of um, uh, 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 a highline membrane, a pulmonary edema, and leading to um, uh, ARDS. Uh, hand in hand with this, there is activation of the coagulation pathway leading to microthrombite formation throughout the body, not only in the lung, and particularly interestingly in the lung, it can lead to uh, uh, pulmonary thrombi formation and worsening the BQ mismatch uh, due to ARDS. Keeping this in mind, uh, there's an interesting paper published in Nature um, earlier in the, in the beginning of the pandemic, and they were talking about a phenomenon known as cytokine storm, or rather cytokine release, uh, cytokine release syndrome. Uh, such such a, a phenomenon was um, seen in a medical condition known as um, hemophagocytic lymph histiocytosis, or the shortened term is HLH. HLH is sort of like an autoimmune condition, uh, which is seen in genetically uh, individuals. Here in COVID, uh, uh, something similar to HLL, clinical features and biochemical parameters, something similar to HLS is, has been shown, hence it's given the uh, uh, mnemonic of secondary HLL. In cytokine storm, there is a, 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 an array of various inflammatory cytokines, particularly in is interleukin 2, interleukin 6, interleukin 7, interleukin 10, uh, uh, colony stimulating factors, TNF. So uh, a soup of cytokines are being released, and these cytokines are, are essentially establishing or uh, perpetuating uh, the disease into the level of ARDS. Uh, it has been said that cytokine release syndrome is essentially mediated by uh, white cell leukocytes. Uh, uh, as, as you may know, there is relative lymphopenia, destruction of lymphocytes and lymphopenia in uh, COVID. Uh, something similar has been demonstrated in septic, severe septic patient, initial, uh, which was named as uh, MAS or macrophage activation syndrome. But what we have seen with cytokine release syndrome is about a couple of times than macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, so the theory of uh, virus, apart from the immune uh, immune response that is going on, the theory uh, the theory says that that the virus itself may be damaging the alveolar capillary endothelia of the lungs, which causes this uh, many times potent macrophage activation syndrome like cytokine storm. Now, uh, this cytokine phenomenon has been seen in, in patients who are critically ill with COVID and those who are not so badly ill or non-severe patients. Both of them, both these groups that you have, we have seen that there's elevated levels of cytokine. So why not then modulating cytokines uh, and trying to see whether that would be of any help in treating COVID patients? Uh, and you also know some of the anti-cytokines drugs like anti-leukin-6, anti-TNF, anti-JAK, 
uh, uh, medications are being treated with some immune-mediated inflammatory conditions and has been shown some good results. So putting you know one in one together, the theory came then why not we try some of the anti-cytokine medications in treating COVID and trying to modulate the immune system. The same paper which I was mentioning in uh, uh, Nature uh, produced this absolutely brilliant graph which talks about uh, elevated levels of cytokines. As you can see, in yellow are the um, uh, cytokine levels in moderate and severe diseases and starting from left-hand side to right-hand right, side, interleukin-8, interleukin-6, interleukin-10 and uh, IP10 levels. All of them are elevated in COVID, uh, I, whether let it be uh, moderately severe or pretty badly, uh, pretty bad COVID, which had to come to ITU and being ventilated, in both patients, cytokines levels are massively high than the normal control, the normal baseline. So in terms of uh, deciding when to start inflammatory uh, and, and when to modulate the immune system, it is important to have a quick understanding of the natural course of so essentially, the symptomatology is brought about by the viral phenomena, viral viremia or replication of the virus inside the body, plus the uh, inflammatory response of the body. You can see stage one, arbitrarily, this is being divided into three stages one, two, and three. And stage one, you can see that the viral response is predominating, and patients at this time would only be having mild constitutional. Whereas as time goes on, the viremia gets less predominant and the inflammatory response starts kicking in. Now, as the inflammatory response goes to stage three or what is known as hyperinflammatory stage, that is the stage where patients have ended up in um, severe uh, shock state with ARDS and multi-organ involvement. So, this also highlights at which point, if, uh, if we are to uh, manipulate the immune system, at which point that we should be manipulating the immune system. There's no point in trying to um, hit the immune system once the door has already been opened. So stage three, trying any immune modulation uh, therapy would be counterproductive. As Similarly, as trying it at stage one would be too risky because all these medications have, have untoward um, side effects. So essentially, the best possible stage to uh, uh, attack the immune system would be early stage two, where the viremic response is subsidizing and the inflammatory response is, is uh, setting up. The key clinical question is, is to how to identify this phase. Right, so immunity for COVID-19 infection is, is being brought about as in any infection by innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system, which comprises of already formed uh, humoral and cellular components. So you have your complements, the cytokines, the chemokines, acute phase, phase proteins, which are already being formed in the body, comes in and trying to attack the uh, viral response. And this is compounded by the non-specific cellular immunity, that is to say the granulocytes, the macrophages, the mast cells, the dendritic cells. And this is the early response that you would be seeing. As opposed to adaptive immune system, where the uh, humoral and cellular components would be coming in and uh, um, giving a helping hand. And this is late onset and a delayed response. And this is more specific. Uh, this is the point where the antibodies are formed, and this is the point where the T and the B lymphocytes comes and uh, play uh, in the picture. So if such is the case, we need to decide what, what form of immune modulators that we will be utilizing to attack the immune system. So immune modulators could be immune stimulants or could be immune suppressants. And each immune stimulant or suppressants could be a specific or non-specific variety. For example, if you take a vaccine, the specific immune stimulant. Um, and I'm not going to talk about vaccine. I'm not a vaccinologist. I'm not an expert in this. So we're not going to talk about it. Uh, uh, and take, for example, um, steroids, Dr. Maruf was uh, talking about, and that's a non-specific immunosuppressant. And we have had a quite a lengthy encounter as to how the immune uh, steroids are acting on, uh, on the immune system to manipulate uh, COVID-19 infection. 
I'll be talking about all the other uh, uh, um, immune modulators uh, later in my lecture. Now, of interest is that some of the other medications that we use for various other conditions, for example, like uh, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, statins, has been shown uh, certain immunomodulatory properties, and this is, this is sort of like an inadvertent finding. And I'll be talking a little bit about uh, them also. So to start with a specific immune modulator, my favorite is uh, interleukin-6 receptor antagonist tocilizumab, or in short form known as TOC. TOC is an anti, uh, it's a monoclonal antibody. It's an anti-human uh, interleukin-6 receptor ant antagonist. And interleukin-6 receptors are, are ubiquitous, that they are in the body as a soluble form or as a membrane bound. They come once uh, interleukin-6 receptors have been activated, they act as signal transducers. So antagonists would stop the signal, signal transducing effect. And uh, uh, they have been used uh, for various rheumatological arthra uh, autoimmune arthritic condition. So backing that evidence, why not we try it in COVID-19? Because uh, COVID-19 seems to be mostly mediated by the immune response. So that's the rationale. That's our homework in starting uh, tocilizumab, in suggesting tocilizumab for, as a uh, immune therapy for COVID-19 infection. Another interleukin receptor antagonist, that is interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, is anakinra. Mm -hmm. Anakinra is a, a recombinant human uh, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. And uh, anakinra has been, uh, surprisingly, has been shown to be of some effective in macrophage activation syndrome triggered by sepsis. So with that knowledge at the back of our mind, uh, COVID-19 it was suggested to be used in COVID-19 infection. Now, I just want to quickly go through to the uh, publication or interim uh, a policy that was being put forward by the Department of Health in the early earlier this year, essentially uh, backed by the findings of the recovery trial, and then the remap and uh, compounded by the remap cap trial, um, talking about usage of immunomodulators, especially specifically tocilizumab in COVID nineteen um, uh, infection. So, who are the ones who were to, who should be uh, treated with COVID uh, uh, tocilizumab? The ones who had been um, hospitalized patient, but the ones who had been either. Uh, Test positive or clinically suspected as COVID-19. The ones who had already been on a course of steroids, as again uh, uh, described earlier by Dr. Maruf. The ones who have had CRP levels more than 75, which gives an indication that the immune system has been has been triggered, so immune process has has started. And the ones who have who are struggling to maintain uh, room air oxygenation, saturations less than 92 on room air, which requiring supplemental oxygenated, uh, oxygenation to keep the oxygenation going on. So both these trial has identified such patients and has suggested to attack the immune system within the first 24 hours, entering it to critical care. So early phase of the uh, inflammatory uh, response, not, not delayed, not too late, as we have discussed during the natural history of COVID-19. Obviously, uh, talk was excluded if there is no hypersensitivity. And uh, because these are tocilizumab uh, or any other immune modulator for that matter, just stops the uh, uh, ability to fight against infection. It is very important that we rule out coexisting infections. Liver functions should be stabilized. Normally it should be less than five times the uh, baseline ASD ALT level. And uh, if a patient is already on a pre-existing immunosuppression, like for example, a chemotherapy or any other immunosuppressants, unfortunately they are excluded uh, from entering into the trial because of the lack of evidence, obviously pregnancy and breastfeeding is being excluded. The dose of tocilizumab that we normally advocate is, about, is um, eight milligram per kilogram. However, for a normal healthy adult, the maximum is 800 milligram. Now at the beginning of the trial process, both recovery and remap cap trial process, uh, we were advised to give two doses, to administer the first dose within first 24 hours, and then uh, after 12 hours, 
if those patients who doesn't mount an enough CRP response, that is to say when the CRP has not dropped less than 75, if given the second dose. However, this has been shown to be counterproductive when analyzing this data. So what is being suggested now is to administer a single dose of tocilizumab, 800 milligram for a healthy or otherwise uh, normal sized adult as a single dose. And it should be given uh, uh, to, via a dedicated line and there should be a strict protocol in policy to decide how the tocilizumab is being administered to be normally diluted in, in about 100 mils of normal saline and run through an hour. And then it should, the line should be flush um, adequately. But before, what is important is before starting the therapy, a battery of tests needs to be sent um, and um, a test to exclude um, any infections like hepatitis B, C, HIV, and varicella, and tuberculosis. Uh, should be excluded. What we normally do is we send blood tests for these infections, but we do not delay starting tocilizumab because the trial protocol uh, strictly said that the drug should be administered within the first 24 hours of um, entering into critical care. And then there should be meticulous uh, monitoring of viral, a vital sign uh, throughout the administration and post-administration of uh, uh, drug. So a word about REMAP-CAP, because uh, REMAP-CAP trial was not meant to be uh, uh, targeting COVID infections. It's essentially a trial that has been that has been there since the days of MERS, and it is essentially that has been there for community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, as the circumstances has changed with COVID, the trial has rapidly changed its outlook, its, its structure, and, and there are multiple arms uh, involving in, in the trial. The arm that um, um, I will be talking more about would be the immune arm of the trial, which essentially has five uh, branches. And these branches involve um, uh, no administ from no, no immune modulators to interference to anakinra to tocilizumab and cerulimab. Cerulimab is another interleukin-6 um, antagonist similar to tocilizumab. In our trust, we use, um, we recruited patients, uh, critically ill patients, patients who came into ITU within the first 24 hours. We recruited patients uh, uh, to um, all these five um, uh, categories under the immune arm of uh, remap cap trial. The trial has uh, produced the, uh, the um, this is the pre, uh, preprint report uh, of the uh, immune arm of remap cap trial. And as you can see, the trial involves the massive number, 2,274 critical ill pa participants throughout the, to, uh, throughout, the, throughout the world. And, um, and, um, and about uh, close to 1,000 patients were uh, assigned uh, with uh, tocilizumab. And the trial results have, sorry, the trial results has confirmed that patients with uh, severe COVID-19 um, who are on respiratory support in the form of high flow oxygen, in the form of NIV, or in the form of um, uh, intubation and on the ventilator, tocilizumab and serolimab are effective in improving survival and also effective in reducing the duration of the organ support that they need. Interestingly, anakinra being effective, uh, even though we had had the history of saying anakinra being effective from sepsis driven. Um, macrophage activation syndrome, but the trial uh, concluded that anakinra is not effective in this population um, as opposed to septic population. So, so that's the tocilizumab, serolimab uh, combination. And then now I'm going to talk about another specific modulator. Um, it's the JAK inhibitor, ruxolitinib. Uh, JAK is essentially a... Um, it's a second messenger system, and it's again bound, uh, it's ubiquitous, it's found um, in, in various organ systems. And JAK inhibitors has been used uh, successfully in some um, hematological malignancies like myelofibrosis and polycythemia rubrovira. So uh, taking that knowledge as a backup, JAK inhibitors were suggested for COVID-19 infection. Unfortunately, to date, there is no published data about using uh, 
ruxolitinib uh, as effective in COVID-19 infection. But having said that, there is uh, uh, two interesting trials of which what we are very uh, interested about is the last trial, which is known as RuxoCOVID event, where ruxolitinib has been suggested for um, ventilated patient, critically ill ICU patients with COVID-19. So we would we would we are waiting eagerly waiting to see the outcome of uh, that trial whether ruxolitinib is the uh, silver bullet that everybody was talking about. So moving forward, another JAK inhibitor which is more familiar uh, is baricitinib. Uh, baricitinib is a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor. Baricitinib uh, has two uh, uh, modes of action. It's anti-inflammatory, being a JAK inhibitor, and also it reduces the uh, entry of the virals uh, into the body. Another thing, good thing about baricitinib is you can take it uh, once a daily dosing regime. So therefore, it has a better um, um, tech profile. And it has low plasma protein binding, uh, uh, ability and it does not interact with the, the cytochrome system. Therefore, concurrently using baricitinib with other drugs like ramdesivir is, um, uh, is promoted. However, one of the side effects of baricitinib is that baricitinib causes thromboembolic phenomenon and we know that COVID-19 is, is a thrombotic disease. Um, one of the uh, larger trials published on New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year talked about baricitinib, ramdesivir, and a placebo combination. And um, this has shown that baricitinib and uh, ramdesivir combination is much better and it is effective in reducing the medium time to recovery of uh, uh, critically ill patients and uh, those who are receiving high flow oxygen or NIV the uh, in, uh, time to recovery had reduced from 18 days to 10 days in the baricitinib and ramdesivir uh, combination. And the mortality rate, 28 day mortality rate has also significantly improved with the baricitinib uh, um, uh, ramdesivir combination. Fortunately, even though baricitinib is a thrombotic drug, fortunately uh, as per this trial, no, not much uh, significant adverse effects were known. No, so taking this knowledge uh, into account, a uh, recovery trial has opened up an immune arm uh, where baricitinib patients are being randomized to be, uh, to be administered uh, for baricitinib. And what we do is that we give four milligrams of those patients who are randomized to recovery, we give four milligrams of uh, baricitinib. We give four milligrams of baricitinib for about 10 days or if they get better and discharge from hospital. Beauty about baricitinib is that it, as opposed to tocilizumab, whereas tocilizumab needs a dedicated IV line, uh, quite meticulous when it's giving intravenously. And as you could imagine, an in intensive sick in ICU patient uh, who, who has multiple infusions, who's TPN is ongoing, who's on vasopressors, having a dedicated line for one drug is not a joke. As opposed to baricitinib, it can be given orally or it can be given uh, nasogastric uh, uh, using the nasogastric route and can crush and given through nasogastric use. The other uh, good thing about um, baricitinib is that the age uh, uh, group, that the lowest age group that the baricitinib can be administered, can be given into pediatric patients and pediatric recovery has also incorporated baricitinib into their randomization arm. Obviously, if there is acute kidney injury, the dose needs to be adjusted. It is contraindicated in neutropenic patients and uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease patients. And if there is acute um, tuberculosis or if there is suspicion of tuberculosis, drug is contraindication, contraindicated. Pregnancy and breastfeeding is, uh, is contraindicated because of uh, lack of evidence. So uh, the results from uh, recovery uh, about baricitinib is still pending. Right, so some of the rare immune modulators, um, I'll be talking about them from now on. Uh, for example, the anti-TNF, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Again, TNF plays an important, crucial role in the inflammatory process we've discussed earlier. Uh, um, and it's, it, it, it activates macro, it, it has dual effect actually. It, it, it activates macrophages and it also um, uh, promotes the inflammatory process. And, and it, pro it provides interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 to 
propagate the inflammatory load. Um, and um, COVID patients has been shown that there's a substantial amount of TNF found in their plasma, saying, uh, highlighting that TNF has an important role to play. So what are the drugs uh, that we have? We have infliximab. Infliximab we are familiar with because infliximab has been used in um, inflammatory bowel conditions like um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and adalimumab. Um, of, and also the infliximab and adalimumab has been used in ankylosing spondylite. Uh, so taking this knowledge as a background, because both these conditions, all these conditions are autoimmune conditions, inflammatory mediated condition, it was suggested to be used in COVID-19 infections. But the disadvantage is that because these are potent um, immune suppressants, there is a risk of having um, uh, opportunistic uh, bacterial and fungal infection. Um, Currently, um, adalimumab, uh, adalimumab is, uh, is the one that is being uh, trialed, um, but up to date, there is no robust evidence to say that this is the magic bullet and, and the intensive care community, uh, he as intensive care community eagerly aw awaits for more further evidence. Now, convalescent plasma is of very interesting uh, at the early uh, part of uh, the COVID uh, infection, when the first wave, uh, the speed came on, everyone was talking about convalescent plasma in big time. Convalescent plasma is essentially provide passive immunization. This is more so because uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-1 infection, convalescent plasma has been successfully used and also convalescent plasma has been successfully used in Ebola and Zika virus and uh, some of the West Nile fever viruses. So it's been effective on other viral conditions. So why not then try it on COVID? Um, the difference of convalescent plasma B to IVIG is that convalescent plasma is being, uh, is being uh, obtained uh, from survivors who has had the prior infection. So the, the plasma then is full of neutralizing uh, antibodies. Together with that, there are other uh, inflammatory and uh, protective inflammatory and uh, clotting factors, which would um, um, provide uh, more protection. So this was that the con how conals and plasma acts. It, it has the direct antiviral effect by the neutralizing antibodies against uh, COVID-2. Uh, and then it has all other pro-inflammatory and complement and auto antibodies which enhance the immune system and provide the um, protection. However, unfortunately, both recovery and the remap cap trial randomized patients for convalescent plasma, but um, uh, both the trials had sadly concluded that there is no robust evidence of convalescent plasma acting on critically ill with patients. So the um, plasma arm of both the trials has to be stopped and we had to go for a, we had to uh, go on for another option. While we were doing the trial, what we did was we gave uh, two units uh, of plasma uh, within uh, uh, first unit, the, the dose interval between the first and the second unit, minimum is 12 hours, but within 48 hours, both units should have been administered. But before administering the uh, plasma, um, COVID antibody test was sent um, so that the, uh, uh, the blunting of the immune response with the neutralizing antibodies could have been assessed. So it's a no for plasma. What about granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factors? Uh, it's been proven from the inflammatory process uh, that I've described earlier that these things are pro-inflammatory. They support formation of inflammatory mediators uh, and patients patients who are known patients with ARDS, they, there are higher levels of granulocyte macrophage pollen stimulating factors in the alveolar fluid. So um, having that knowledge um, in mind, um, um, Drugs were, uh, drugs were designed to have immunomodulatory effects again, convalescent plasma. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, 
this has not proven uh, much effect. So this is another no and, and had gone out of the uh, out of federation. So, so I'll just quickly run through the specific immune modulators that we have for um, COVID-19 infection or typically in COVID patients. Now, what I'm going to go through now is the uh, other drugs which were used for um, different purposes, but has shown in advertent immunomodulatory problem, of which much talked about and much interested is, is the group of macrolides, the azithromycin, the erythromycin, the erythromycin, and the fidoxifine. Now, these are antibacterial uh, drugs. However, as time goes on, uh, uh, the scientific community became more aware about the anti-inflammatory and immunomodulating properties of these drugs. Now, in the case of azithromycin was, was the favorite, and in the case of azithromycin, azithromycin is acting at, at two places, at two phases when it comes to natural history of COVID. In the acute phase, the azithromycin has the ability of, to reduce all these inflammatory uh, mediators that, that were of concern about that we were interested in. And in the resolution phase, the later phase, the azithromycin is capable of uh, providing um, a program cell death neutrophils and try to hold the immune response. Unfortunately, despite all these theories on paper, no proven clinical benefit has been shown azithromycin and therefore azithromycin has gone out of favor. Uh, having said that, I'm going to talk about two trials, um, how the scientific community or how the scientific data has been manipulated to um, to uh, what's the word, get what we want to hear uh, during this early part of the COVID pandemic. This study, which was initially uh, published um, on the Lancet uh, early 2020 by Mera and others, has, has shown about a massive number of patients, about 96,000 patients, who were randomized to a combination of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, and has shown that there is no significant mortality uh, benefits from using. Mind you, this was the time when a, a famous political uh, a public figures was, was suggesting uh, patients take, uh, you know, um, hydroxychloroquine, um, um, azithromycin, and what under the sun. Within, as you can see, within a month of publication, publicating this on the Lancet, the Lancet had to retract the publication, saying that there has been uh, some foul play in analyzing the data. So Mera's uh, 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 study was not given the due recognition. However, thereafter, JAMA has published it at a similar time period. JAMA has published uh, another trial, which is conducted by Rosenberg. This was conducted in, um, in a group of more than uh, close to 1,500 patients, which has shown a similar um, a clinical picture. So uh, there's no significant difference um, in using as a macrolide, azithromycin alone, or azithromycin hydroxychloroquine alone, or azithromycin hydroxychloroquine combination, or placebo. So there's no difference in between any of the four groups. Therefore, azithromycin had gone out of favor from that point. Having said that, in our trust, what we do is when patient comes into the unit and when they are critically ill, patients are being, when patients needs to be given tocilizumab within first 24 hours of admission, we empirically start broad uh, group of antibiotics. We, we start um, tazosine uh, and um, azithromycin or clarithromycin. But at that point, we'll be sending blood cultures and uh, um, S4 atypical uh, bacterial infection. As soon as we get the results, we uh, stop giving any of the macrolides or any of the other stronger antibiotics. This is in a way sort of like a safe play because we will be giving uh, tocilizumab before the first 24 hours, uh, before we get any uh, results about the uh, any um, bacterial infection or the blood culture. So this we still continue this practice, but that is not anything to do with uh, thinking about the immunomodulator uh, activity about uh, azithromycin or macrolide. Hydroxychloroquine is a drug of, drug of the talk um, 
at the early part of 2020, and hydroxychloroquine has been shown to inhibit interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. Unfortunately, recovery has very badly attacked hydroxychloroquine and said that there is no evidence, no any beneficial effect of using hydroxychloroquine and hydroxychloroquine has gone out of favor. And hydroxychloroquine, on the other hand, um, high doses of hydroxychloroquine has shown to cause uh, dangerous QT prolongation together with, uh, uh, with macrolide. So um, we no longer use hydroxychloroquine. OKD is a study uh, which was one which is conducted in UK uh, due to the uh, 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 findings from the recovery trial. The um, NIH uh, suspended this trial, uh, saying that it is not efficacious and it is not safe to con. What about statins? Um, statins. It's been you know since ages the immunomodulatory effect. Of statins has been has been um, discussed. It's um, uh, the effects of statins in blocking interleukin six is of interest here. Uh, having said that, all these in immunomodulatory effects of statin has been described in in vitro studies and in animal studies. Unfortunately, not much has been uh, has been validated in human studies. So the current uh, Yes, do continue unless there is a contraindication. And if the patient, if a COVID patient develops an indication to have statin, yes, do continue unless there is contraindication. Having said that, we map cat trial randomizing patients for the usage of statin. So in in uh, months to come, in years to come, when we get the findings, the analysis of the remap cap uh, statin arm, we we the, the thinking pattern may be different, but as I speak, uh, that is where we stand in terms of that. The other really interesting uh, uh, domain of non-specific uh, inadvertent immunomodulation are the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, axis inhibitors. They're antihypertensives. It's long since uh, shown that they have anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects. This is compounded by the fact that SARS-CoV-2 virus attacks into the body using the angiotensin ACE2 receptor. So a patient, if a patient who's already on um, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, there's this theory to say that uh, there is upregulation of um, ACE2 receptors, therefore high, they, these patients become more susceptible to uh, COVID infection. Is that the case? On the other hand, there's this opposing evidence that once the uh, once patients are on ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, okay, there is an element of upregulation of um, uh, ACE2 uh, angiotensin converting enzyme receptors, but there is also more angiotensin too. So up, you have the upregulators receptors and you have the unopposed um, um, substrate. So the interaction between the two is that, that the angiotensin two is being broken down into various byproducts of angiotensin. The name does angiotensin one to angiotensin seven. Now, angiotensin two is the nasty guy. Angiotensin two is the is responsible for for inflammation, for, for oxidation, for vasoconstriction, for fibro. Whereas if angiotensin 2 is broken down into byproducts, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin uh, 7, they are the good guys. They are responsible for anti-inflammation, antioxidation, and vasodilatation. Right. What evidence do we have to back this? A large study, which was done in, uh, in uh, United States, has given us the answer. Analyzed these patients, group of patients uh, who are taking antihypertensives, who unfortunately got positive for COVID also. And the ultimate conclusion is that, uh, sorry, ultimate conclusion is that angiotensin receptor blockers or angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors has no relation to COVID infection. If a patient comes in and if this patient is on uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers 
And if it warrants to have an antihypertensive, i.e. hemodynamically stable, continue that. If this patient comes in and this patient has another indication, for example, say assuming patient developed MI or so, another indication where um, uh, ACE inhibitors can be introduced, go along that pathway and introduce uh, uh, ACE inhibitors or angi angiotensin receptor blockers. Do not use angiotensin receptor blockers or uh, ACE inhibitors just because the patient is COVID positive because there's no correlation between COVID-19 in being on angiotensin receptor um, um, ACE inhibitors or uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. This is again compounded by a large Italian study, which was carried out in Lombardy area of Italy, which essentially said the same thing. However, in this study, they have found out that there are more patients, more COVID positive patients, who were on, um, who were taking um, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors. But when uh, meta when microanalysis was done, it was shown that these patients were taking these drugs because of the cardiovascular issue. And the area that the study involves uh, incorporate a population that are, they are at high risk of high prevalence of cardiovascular compound. Therefore, that is completely a different catalog. So what I said earlier stands as it is. The patient comes in, and if this patient is in a um, renin angiotensin axis inhibitors, and patient is needs an antihypertensive, carry on. Do not just because the patient is COVID positive. Now, I said that the remap cap is currently investigating about uh, uh, the, uh, British for British data or UK data for angiotensin converting enzyme, that's already an angiotensin axis in meters and the correlation between uh, SARS CoV 2. What I say now might change in a couple of months' time once we get more robust evidence. But as I speak, this is what is suggested, and this is that. Another uh, inadvertent immunomodulator, colchicine. Colchicine is such a poisonous drug. It is a, it's a, it's a speedal poison. Colchicine has been used for various um, 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 arthritic conditions and, um, and pericarditis because the drug has shown that some immunomodulatory effects why not try it in COVID. The large retrospective study which analyzed patients who were on colchicine, the ability of these patients to get COVID and the ultimate conclusion is that colchicine is so tough. There's no, there's no relationship between colchicine being providing any protective effect uh, against COVID. However, uh, colchicine being such a toxic drug, having uh, prescribing colchicine to try to get the anti-inflammatory effect for COVID can actually burden the ARDS because uh, colchicine at higher doses can damage type 2 units in lung and it can also cause um, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Therefore, uh, uh, colchicine had grown out of favor. Colchicine was incorporated in uh, recovery but within a matter of a couple of months, they have abandoned and they have given up, you said, the colchicine. So we no longer recruit anybody to colchicine under the IVIG, as intensivists, IVIG is not a strange drug to us. We've been using IVIG for um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, so various other, um, for uh, toxic tox syndrome. So the difference between IVIG and the convalescent plasma is that IVIG is non-specific immunoglobulins as opposed to convalescent plasma where there is a specific targeted neutralizing and, uh, uh, and antibodies and um, uh, uh, and the mechanism of IVIG acting on the immune system is very complex. Uh, the uh, IVIG again going out of favor and IVIG is quite uh, thrombotic and COVID is a disease that there is a disseminated uh, microtrome by formation. So IVIG no longer uh, is being used. I have used IVIG in uh, four, of, four of our patients in our unit, but the indications were different. Two of the patients has had uh, COVID-related Guillain-Barre syndrome, where IVIG is indicated, and two of the other patients has had uh, COVID positive and found a fulminant uh, myocarditis 
those two patients we have used uh, IVIG. Apart from this, uh, this sort of isolated case reports, I, IVIG otherwise not is not being favored for COVID. Uh, interference. Uh, interference are uh, um, another um, cytokine. Uh, it not only it has anti-inflammatory, interference also has uh, reduced the viral multiplication. multiplication uh, and um, unfortunately, there's no robust evidence uh, for interference. Uh, remap cap trial has uh, randomized patients for interference. However, what has happened was the randomized the randomization process is such only a, like a handful of patients, only 41 patients were randomized to the interferon arm and the, the conclusions were sort of like vague. So interference has also gone out of faith. So those were, those were the drugs that as far as we can recall, of, as far as we know of, that has been used against for immune modulation. As you can see on this graph, you can see there's so many other uh, uh, entities, so many other drugs that can be used and theoretically be uh, tried. It's even worse, can you see the, the amount of receptors that can be modulated, uh, that can be manipulated uh, and, 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 and the amount of drugs that can be used on each of these receptors. As years to come, we may have a different story. Who knows, we may have the silver bullet. One of these mm, micromolecular drug may produce the um, KO, we hope so. But um, I think it's, 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 too, it's too, too early to um, be, um, that optimistic. Uh, this this uh, diagram summarizes the number of medications that, that could be tried. So essentially, we've thrown at everything on SARS, except the QT thing. We've thrown at everything on this virus, haven't we? Do you think that there's anything more that we could do about this? Always, there's always something. So vitamin D. Vitamin D has been shown to have quite a lot of anti-inflammatory and uh, uh, anti-cytokine properties. And this shows how vitamin D interacts with the uh, immune system. And it has also been shown that critically in patients, vitamin D levels are often, often low. And particularly, the COVID has been hit badly by uh, ethnic minorities, the BAME community. And it has been shown that this community is Specifically, uh, um, lacks enough levels of vitamin D in their blood. So various treatment regimes has been postulated. Various treatment regimes are being trialed, but yet we have not um, a robust evidence as to what vitamin B D level dosage we should be doing. Tactic or is it a treatment uh, modality that we are talking? So this is something that we might hear in the future. So vitamin A, retinoid. Vitamin A has been uh, used to manipulate the immune system, particularly in, um, in measles, uh, 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 cases of measles, and or particularly in Ebola, particularly in uh, resource poor settings. It's been uh, trialed the effects of uh, vitamin A, particularly retinoic acid, uh, in, uh, uh, in COVID uh, related immune manipulation. Again, we do not have enough data, and this might we might hear in the future as to what sort of uh, usage regime, if at all, if it's effective and if that is what process regime that we should be. This, the complexity of this diagram itself shows how badly that vitamin A is interacting with the immune system. Now, another new thing is etoposide. Etoposide is a, it's a two isomerase inhibitor and that has been uh, successfully used on on, on a condition called HLH, uh, uh, lymphohistiocytosis, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, which I've talked about earlier. And COVID resembles a secondary HLH type of a condition. Therefore, etoposide has been suggested. And etoposide is capable of um, subsidizing most of the symptoms, most of the signs, most of the blood results in HLH patients. So taking 
this into account, which of a side is also under trial, and this might be something that we hear um, in the field. Right, so we've used antimalarials, antibacterials, antivirals, you know, we've used everything. Isn't, is there anything more that we could be used? Fear not, there's always something. Now, uh, empagliflozy. I mean, it's a mouthful to pronounce. Forget about using this drug. It's, it's a mouthful to pronounce itself. So empagliflozine is an anti-diabetic drug. It's a new anti-diabetic drug. It essentially inhibits um, glucose absorption from the tubules of the kidney. And uh, um, this has been suggested because this promotes the energy balance in the body from uh, glucose to lipids, whereas virus promotes, virus likes to stay in a glucose-supported uh, metabolism environment as opposed to a lipid-supported metabolism environment. And also, uh, empagliflozine has an anti-inflammatory. Considering all these into account, uh, empagliflozine has been uh, suggested. Uh, this is also compounded by the fact that uh, DARE trial and DARE trial looked at uh, um, uh, another um, uh, hypoglycemic, dapagliflozine. Uh, that, however, that it was concluded that dapagliflozine is not um, effective. Uh, so then it was moved on to empagliflozine. Currently, um, empagliflozine is being uh, assessed under recovery trial and our hospital, our unit, we recruit patients uh, under recovery uh, trial for empagliflozidine. So what we do is we give 10 milligram uh, of the drug for 28 days and we exclude those patients who are on diabetic, uh, uh, type 1 diabetes or those who have had a history of diabetic ketoacidosis. So again, from recovery, we might hear more about that. Is that all? No, it's, no that's not all. There's something, uh, it has been said that, that the um, uh, vagus nerve stimulation has immunomodulatory effect, particularly the uh, spleen is involved in uh, secreting various anti-inflammatory mediators uh, and uh, stimulating uh, these anti-inflammatory mediators by, by mm -hmm. um, stimulating the vagus nerve be, could be uh, beneficial. Unfortunately, there is no direct branch of the vagus to the nerve. So it's all uh, chemical mediators who runs from the tips of the uh, vagus nerve diffuse into the spleen. Therefore, what they have done was they have bluntly stimulated the entire vagus nerve just to get the uh, beneficial effect. Uh, but having said that, there is no uh, beneficial effect, but the side effect due to uh, you know, general vagus stimulation. Side effects, again, results are pending. So that's a lot to take in. I went through from specific immune modulators, from non-specific immune modulators, what is to expect in the future, and uh, um, the inadvertent immune uh, modulators, which has gone out of favor. So in a summary, there's various different drug classes, drug categories has been tested, and some of has been disproved, and some the results are pending. So the immune modulation, in terms of critically ill patients is quite challenging. What we, as Dr. Maru said earlier, what we, what we talked about today and what we plan today would be wrong in a couple of months time when more results come. But until we hear more, we know. That's it from me, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Barnapura, for that uh, very informative talk. And uh, because of the time constraints, I would like to entertain only a few questions. Now, uh, uh, the attendees have asked on two drugs, uh, tofacitinib and the ivermectin. Uh, yeah, so ivermectin is an anti-helminthic. And ivermectin causes, um, uh, ivermectin has been shown some promising results early in early trials, but it's not due to immune modulation. Ivermectin essentially is an anti, as an antiviral. So that's why I has not specifically talked about ivermectin. It's an antiviral, and I was about to talk about the immune modulatory. And so ivermectin is being uh, 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 trialed under recovery. 
uh, there is an arm for ivermectin. The antiviral have, uh, arm has an ivermectin. What was the other drug you were said? They were saying? Uh, Tofacitidine. No, I have. I don't know about that. Sorry, we have not used that. Uh, uh, must be one of the minute drugs on that massive chart. But my knowledge is quite poor on. And uh, they, now uh, we use tocilizumab uh, quite frequently uh, as an mm -hmm. immunomodulator, and certain like we have the IL six levels. Mm -hmm. uh, you all sort of do IL six levels before tocilizumab, or is there any correlation? with the IL-6 levels uh, and giving tocilizumab? So, no, we don't blunt, we don't routinely measure interleukin-6 level because tocilizumab is now the standard of practice and the results has come from two main uh, COVID trials in UK, that is recovery and remap cap. We don't wait for blood results. So standard of care is when a patient comes in, A steroid, B tocilizumab, unless and otherwise contrary. The trial, both the trial, the COVID, the recovery and remap have, have used um, blood samples for interleukin 6 levels, and they have shown that there is a dramatic response uh, with tocilizumab and serolimab, but not with anakinra, because it's already being agreed it's a standard of care and we do not measure. Okay. Uh, and, and the timing of tocilizumab now, for example, mm. if a patient comes to the ICU now, the recommendation is, as you said, the, uh, the CRP more than uh, 75 in the, in, in, the, in the escalating phase of the disease. Now, if someone decides to give, a to give tocilizumab because the patient is not improving with the therapy, mm. uh, is there any time, timing? Uh, can you give it late in the disease? Yeah, so you can you can take a call. We've done that also. You can take a call um, to see whether this patient could uh, uh, would benefit from talk. But that's that's a specific that's a specialist decision. That's a multidisciplinary decision. What we normally do is we send a, say somebody comes in somebody ha who has missed that opportunity of having tocilizumab within twenty four hours. A B somebody who has already had tocilizumab and after a couple of days we think that the disease process is still virulent. So what we do is we have sort of like an MDT decision. We send a COVID panel of blood and we see how badly the, how badly the inflammatory process is. Peritemia, high CRP, high LDH levels, high alkaline phosphate levels. And we also send uh, um, procalcitonin levels. And or rather sequential pro procalcitonin level, then you can get an idea whether this procalcitonin level is a marker of, uh, of uh, hyperinflammation or is it a marker of sepsis? And we, we send a uh, blood culture. So particular, it's, it's a specific decision and that decision is not taken light. So to answer your question, are we giving tocilizumab off, off the label or off, off? Uh, of trials, yes, we do. It's a standard of care. Do we give the second dose those patients whom do we think that should be benefiting? Yes, we do. But that's specific indication. Each individual patient needs to be taken into account. We do not take it lightly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank both the speakers, Dr. Maharuf and Dr. Varnapura, for sparing your time. I know all of you are busy, uh, especially during this uh, pandemic. And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, also the Ceylon College of Physicians collaborating with us uh, for this expert webinar. I hope uh, attendees have uh, got uh, uh, information. And uh, I think probably in the future, we might hear more uh, new data or new information uh, I think it's very difficult to fight against the virus rather than a bacteria. So uh, thank you very much for all of you and uh, have a good night and stay safe. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Much. Thanks.